Thank you, and welcome to this uh, panel on the subject of creativity, spirituality, and computer science. Um, I uh, am very grateful for the four distinguished uh, guests we have here um, with us to have taken the time to share um, their uh, afternoon with all of us. Um, let me tell you how I'd like the format of this to, to be. I'm going to first introduce the four um, panelists to you, and then I will uh, ask each of them in the order in which they're seated to my right to um, make uh, a few uh, introductory remarks on the um, subject of the panel. Um, and then we'll probably have some, when they've finished that, some crosstalk among them, um, exchanging uh, ideas and having some quick reactions. Uh, but I want to leave at least uh, half an hour for, uh, for discussion with the audience, if not uh, even more, depending on how long they take. So there'll be plenty of time for you all to, to jump in and ask questions, make statements. Um, but yes, I, my job is um, tolerance enforcer. That's my, uh, that's my unofficial title for the day. So let me um, begin by introducing all four speakers. Um, to immediately to my right is uh, Guy L. Steele, Jr., who is a distinguished engineer at Sun Microsystems Laboratories. Received his AB in Applied Mathematics from Harvard College in 1975, his SM and PhD in computer science and artificial intelligence from MIT in 1977 and 1980. He is the co-author or author of four books on programming languages, Common Lisp, C, High Performance, Fortran, and Java, as well as the Hacker's Dictionary, which many of us know and love. Um, he is a recipient of the Grace Murray Hopper Award from the Association for Computing Machine, and as well as uh, being a former ACM fellow fellow of the American Association for Artificial Intelligence, um, and uh, has uh, many achievements in the world of computer science. Uh, again, some of those that have had the most impact were as designer of the original Emacs command set and as the first person to port tech. Yeah. At, <laughs> at Sun Microsystems, he's responsible for research in language design and implement, implementation strategies and architectural and software support for the specification of Java. And I will now depart from Guy's formal biography to introduce a slightly autobiographical element to his biography. <laughs> Guy Steele was a student in the first course I ever taught at Harvard in the fall of 1974. And um, I have no memory whatsoever of what the subject of this course was. <laughs> I literally don't remember anything but I but it was a great it was a great course there were 17 people in it I went back and looked at the grade sheet last night <laughs> it was really quite amazing two of them are now tenured professors at Stanford Eric Roberts and Mike Genesareth John Reif who's a professor at Duke was also in the same class and Guy and several other people have also gone on to uh, influential careers but the thing I do remember about the course was Guy's final exam. Because there, in the middle of some rambling, disconnected, incorrect approach to a problem, all of a sudden there was a break. I literally, I didn't write this down, I don't have the blue book, I just remember it 25 years later. It broke and he said, ah, now I see all too clearly the error of my ways. <laughs> Now, any of you who's a student, remember that anything you write may, will survive. And I'm sure neither one of us ever suspected that 25 years later, I would be in a position to ask him, what on earth were you talking about? <laughs> and can you relate that, please, to the subject of the, of the panel discussion? Well, actually... I can't remember either, and I can't remember my grade it was in the course, but I do have all my course notes. Okay. <laughs> and we should get together, because I can to look those up. All right. Um, after Guy, we will have uh, Manuelo Veloso speak. Manuelo is Associate Professor of Computer Science at Carnegie Mellon University. She received her PhD in Computer Science from Carnegie Mellon University in 1992. She received the BS degree in Electrical Engineering in 1980 and MSc in uh, 
in computer engineering in 1984 from the Instituto Superior, Superior Tecnico in Lisbon. Professor Veloso's long-term research goal is the effective construction of teams of intelligent agents where cognition, perception, and action are combined to address planning, execution, and learning tasks, in particular uncertain dynamic adversarial environments. And she has been working on the concrete problem of soccer research, that is robotic soccer research, not the uh, uh, NCAA championships. She has developed robotic soccer teams which have participated in the RoboCup international competitions in three different categories computer simulation, fully distributed agents, small wheeled robots, and Sony four-legged robots, and has had some success in those competitions. She is uh, the author of uh, over 70 technical papers uh, and the editor of um, several volumes, and she has been awarded the NSF Career Research Award in 1995 and the Allen Newell Medal for Excellence in Research in 1997. To Manuela's right is Donald Knuth, who truly needs no introduction. Again, if I can voice, I'm sure everybody has a Don Knuth autobiographical story in some way who's in this audience, at least um, many of you, I'm sure, do. My first job after I graduated from college, where I was a hacker, was to go to a research, um, national research laboratory in 1968, and I remember after I was there about six months, one recent arrival from the West Coast telling me that there was this guy at Stanford who'd written this book about computer programming, but it was different from the books about computer programming that um, you were used to seeing, which were language reference manuals and so on, although it had lots of code in it. And it sounded quite fascinating, and I remember going out and ordering a copy of this book and reading it, and I came back to graduate school a number of years um, uh, later, um, far more fascinated with the potential, intellectual potential for the field than I had had from my, um, my experience as an undergraduate. Don, of course, is a professor emeritus of the art of computer programming at Stanford. He is, uh, has bachelor's and master's degrees from Case Western Reserve and a PhD from Caltech. He is the author of many, many influential, um, uh, highly influential books, not only the Art of Computer Programming series, uh, but the Computers and Typesetting series, and his non-technical book, 316 Bible Fonts Illuminated, about which he spoke here a few weeks ago. He's received many honors, the Turing Award, National Medal of Science, the Steele Prize from the American Mathematical Society, the John von Neumann Medal, the Harvey Prize, and the Kyoto Prize, uh, and many honorary degrees from many institutions. And finally, uh, Mitch Kapoor is uh, the fourth speaker. He is the uh, founder of Lotus Development Corporation, designer of Lotus 123, the desktop productivity tool which led to the way ubiquitous ubiqu led the way to the ubiquitous adoption of the personal computer as a business tool in the 1980s. For 20 years, he has been at the forefront of the information technology revolution as an entrepreneur, investor, social activist, philanthropist, and most recently, venture capitalist. He is also a former teacher of transcendental meditation and a fervent admirer of the Dalai Lama. So, thank you all for being here, and uh, Guy, I'd like you to begin, if you would, and please do use the microphone. I want to talk about spiritual inspiration in computer science both as a means of study and as an object of study. The study of computer science as we know it is a human activity so far. Human activity is spiritual at least in part and therefore the study of computer science is spiritual at least in part. But this may seem to beg the question. My point is that by human activity I mean activity with a purpose and I want to talk here about purpose. Why do computer science? Because it's fun? because it's beautiful, to earn enough money to support a family, to earn enough money to buy mango ice cream at Toscanini's, <laughs> to improve the lot of humankind, to serve God. For me, it's all of the above. What we call computer science is actually an interesting mixture of science and mathematics. Now, there's often a confusion between the content of science and the methods of science, and between the content of mathematics and the methods of mathematics. 
The scientific method is not science, but rather an extremely successful cultural convention. The content of science and mathematics, I think, has no purpose. It merely is. The content of mathematics is a logical description of relationships. The content of science is a set of mappings between the content of mathematics and the real world. A scientific theory may agree with or disagree with observations, but it has no intrinsic purpose. A mathematical theory may be consistent or inconsistent, but it also has no intrinsic purpose. The activity, the human activity that produces or discovers or uses these theories, however, does have purpose. Multiple purposes, in fact, and these purposes guide our allocation of resources to the effort. So what is purpose? I think purpose is related to consciousness. I'm not quite sure how. Purpose links our actions or perhaps our mental states from moment to moment. In many ways, purpose reminds me very strongly of the physical concept of momentum. Zeno of Elia famously claimed in his arrow paradox that motion was impossible. Roughly speaking, he said that at any instant of time, an arrow must be in a particular place, occupying a space just the size of the arrow, within which there is no extra space to move and at another instant it is in another such space. Then he asks, where and when can the motion occur? Bertrand Russell put it this way, the arrow is never moving, but in some miraculous way the change of position has to occur between the instants, that is to say, not at any time whatever. Modern physics addresses Zeno's paradox first by using real numbers to model space and time and accepting the mathematics of limits as an explanation though there are plenty of reasons to believe that this model is not realistic and breaks down at quantum scales. And second, by introducing the concept of momentum, which is a magic extra piece of state. At any given moment of time, the arrow has not only position, but momentum. And momentum is exactly what distinguishes an arrow at rest from an arrow in motion. Momentum as such, like energy, is ineffable. You can't see it the way you can see position. Momentum is the link through time. It describes how future positions of the arrow will be related to the present position. Of course, momentum can be altered by the action of outside forces. In exactly the same way, I think purpose is the link through time that describes how future states of consciousness will be related to the present state. And purpose may be altered by outside influences. Much of the content of religion has to do less with questions of fact and more with questions of purpose. Where Genesis 1.1 says, in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. This is to me, first and foremost, a statement about purpose. Where there is no purpose, we speak not of creation, but of accident or happenstance. Where John 3.16 says, yes, this is how God loved the world. He gave his only child so that. It is a statement about God's purpose. Where does purpose come from? Whatever we may regard as the source of the physical universe, I believe also may be the source of purpose. It seems to me that purpose is exactly as likely to appear suddenly from nowhere as mass is, or momentum. I believe provisionally, as a scientist should with any theory, in most aspects of the Big Bang Theory, though there are some problems with the details. And I believe that God was behind it and had a purpose. I believe provisionally in most aspects of the theory of evolution, though there are some problems with the details. And I believe that God is behind it and has a purpose. I will madly conjecture that purpose may in some sense be conserved as rigorously as mass energy or angular momentum, and that just as the universe appears to contain a preponderance of matter over antimatter, perhaps it contains a preponderance of good purpose over evil purpose. Then again, that may be just wishful thinking on my part. The questions who and what are answered by things. The questions where and when are answered by states of things, positions in space and time. It makes me wonder why we don't have a question word whose answer is the momentum of a thing. The question how is answered by a process, by some relationship between space and time. And in fact, momentum is such a relationship, so maybe how is my missing question word. And that leaves us with why, the answer to which is a purpose. Now what does this have to do with spiritual inspiration, the subject of this panel? Let me point out that we can understand the word inspiration in two senses something that imparts a purpose or something that fulfills a purpose. Inspiration in the ongoing sense sustains the effort of a quest. Inspiration in the instantaneous sense supplies the object of the quest. Such a quest may be intellectual, emotional, or spiritual. Not that I think these three categories constitute sharp distinctions. On the contrary, when it comes to why we do what we do, whether it be computer science research, day trading, 
flipping burgers, or caring for lepers in Calcutta. All purposes are implicitly spiritual matters. Usually we associate the term spiritual with good as opposed to evil, but I think it is fair to say that a selfish or thoughtless purpose is also spiritual in nature. I don't have time in these preliminary remarks to explore the subject of good and evil or whether we have free will. I will remark briefly that I regard evil as exactly that which is opposed to God's purpose. This definition may be tautological. And I think that the most important aspect of the question of free will is not whether our choice of cake or pie for dessert is predictable, whether by men or by God, or whether our study of computer science was predestined, but rather whether each of us has a free choice between good and evil. Now let me turn to spiritual inspiration as object of study. To me, the core of computer science is the study of processes, of descriptions of processes, that is programs, of descriptions of descriptions of processes, that is programming languages, of descriptions of descriptions of descriptions of processes, which is the theory of semantics, and so on. And oh yes, all their mathematical consequences. And as an afterthought, how well the descriptions predict the behavior of actual computing machines in the real world. That's the science part. We find it very difficult to discuss processes of a certain complexity without using the terminology of purpose and a certain amount of anthropomorphism. I remember being struck by a comment I found in some source code not long after I was hired as a systems programmer at Project Mac, which was the predecessor to MIT's lab for computer science. The comment said something like, this register is sacred to the garbage collector. <laughs> I had not expected to encounter the terminology of religion, but sacred can mean set aside for exclusive use, set aside for a purpose, and the meaning was instantly clear to me. It expressed not only a fact, but a purpose in the code. Just as analogies to human social structures, such as committees and bus queues, sometimes help us to design data structures and algorithms, and just as the attempt to model human intellectual behavior on a computer has led to important insights, so I suspect that studying human purpose, inspiration, and spirituality may lead us to important advances in computer science. And we will use metaphors rooted in these areas to help deal with ever, ever greater complexity. I think we will be compelled ever more in the future to apply the vocabulary and concepts of purpose and perhaps even of religion in our study of computer science. A Turing machine can compute anything computable if it makes the state transitions in accordance with its rules. But whence comes the impetus to make those transitions? To compute effectively, a Turing machine needs if not spiritual purpose, at least computational momentum. As we study computational processes of ever greater complexity, we find ourselves drawn ever more to describe a process as having purpose. At first, the purpose inherited from its creator, but perhaps later a purpose of its own. And then we must face the question of whether this use of language is merely a metaphor or in some deep sense the truth. At this point, we get into such difficult questions as to whether a computer program can have purpose or consciousness or free will, or even a soul. I do not propose to address this question now because I'm still chewing on the same questions concerning myself. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, before passing the, the, uh, the microphone to Manuela, I, um, let me do what I should have done before, I, before Guy started speaking, which was to read you the question that I asked the four panelists <laughs> to answer. <laughs> Now, if you're really good, you can infer it from the answer. But I think uh, here, here, was the, uh, here was the question that I posed um, to think about. Computer science is an exact science if there ever was one, and arguably the ultimate man-made science. In what sense is spiritual inspiration a relevant concept in computer science? So that it's a broad, it was a broad question, but an attempt to get uh, people somewhere on the same subject. So I think that, uh, I, that would have been fairer if I'd said that before Guy started. Thank you. Manuela. Okay, so I guess that uh, Harry didn't have to remind you of the question because I actually would like to take these five minutes or seven to be more down to earth and say the problem that I face as a computer scientist. So computer science back in the 50s was described by uh, Alan Perlis, Alan Newell, and Herb Simon when they founded the computer science department at Carnegie Mellon in the following way. They defined it as, the, as actually they said, this is their words, computer science is the study of computers and the phenomena that surround them. Within this phenomena that surround them came these artificial intelligence 
as one of the areas of computer science. And this artificial intelligence in which I'm engaged doing research has very, very ambitious goals that kind of confrontate very, you know, very deeply this concept of creativity, spirituality, and God. So the goals of artificial intelligence are really to build fully intelligent artifacts with cognition, perception, action, learning, creativity, creativity emotion, uh, all the characteristics in some sense of the creatures of God that eventually we are. So there we go. I eventually believe in God. I do. But I am also an AI researcher. And do I believe that such cre creatures can be invented by me, can be invented by my students, can be invented by my computer science algorithms? Are we going to be able to replicate, I mean, in the real world, these little creatures? So to tell you frankly, I hope never to have to face this question. I just go on with my life. I do my research. I keep my beliefs in God. And I just go on. And I don't want to be, have to say, yes, there will be a little robot that will have its soul or no. That's a, an ultimate impossible goal. Now, because I actually want to avoid to face this question, and I'm here avoiding to face it, let me tell you a little bit, actually, how I get my robots actually to at least show a little bit of creativeness. So robotics has been seen as a science of precision. I was last week in a robotics faculty retreat of Carnegie Mellon. I'm on sabbatical here. And robots have been used in factories. And I saw films, which you all saw, of factories of Sony, you know, precisely drilling holes, tons of arms, all at the same time, building these cars, building these machines. And those are called robots then we see precise robots that go into space and fix those satellites and go to Mars exactly land there at the right time. Everything is precision. But what I face is that I really would like robots to live with us. And my little robots that play soccer, believe me, do not do preci precise things at all. They really do not kick into the goal all the time. They spin on the spot when the batteries go down. They cannot do real passes. They push other robots, even if they know it's a foul. They do all sorts of things. And they actually get me, who I coach them, and all my students shouting at them, go, kick, do it, get out of the way, go around. Which is like, strikingly, how do you say, unscientific. Because uh, you do, in, and when I, because you really act towards these little creatures as if they were creatures. You see people in the audience looking at these little so Sony dog robots, where I am giving a big technical explanation that the robot is a mechanical thing in which you can switch the legs. And I just press a button and I put another leg, and I see this panic in the eyes of my audience. You are hurting the dog. And I'm saying, I'm sorry, this is a, a robot. Still, and I'm saying, well. And I really have faced the problem of not being able to show how to switch a, do a leg in a robot because the audience of four-year-olds almost cries in front of me if I touch the robot and I turn off, they just break the leg. So it is true that actually this concept of us having spirituality uh, I would dare to say that one day we could mimic, and we don't know what spirituality is for me, you don't know what my soul is, you don't know as much as me, and probably will be faced one day with little robots that you don't know what's inside of them and what really it's there. The tricky thing is to build computer science the way I do, I think, to be able to look at the problem as a probabilistic action selection problem rather than a precise deterministic algorithm to address the uncertainty of the world. My little robots are built as little machines that do probabilistic decision making. So they surprise you. They do, because you cannot foresee 
everything that will happen in the world and you did not pre-program everything and furthermore you have a learning component that adjusts online values that you know can be adjustable but you don't know how they are adjustable. So if you have a chance of one day watching this little robot or you're getting engaged in computer science research at the AI level, the right approach that I defend is to have this random component that probably will capture what spirituality is for humans. And that's my point. Thank you. Da? Okay. Um, <clears throat> before I start, I wanted to I want to mention that the, uh, the general title of these lectures is uh, things that computer scientists rarely talks about. And, and uh, I have to mention that uh, uh, immediately after I gave my first lecture a few weeks ago, uh, the next morning I went to the, um, the morning prayer at Harvard Chapel and it was Harry Lewis giving the, give, giving the meditation. So, uh, so not only was he an exception, as Anna said, but he also was the, a counterexample to my, uh, to my statement um, uh, uh, on, which I based, uh, uh, on which I based these lectures. Um, now, I, uh, I was delighted to hear the, the title of the panel discussion uh, because uh, it's about creativity and, and, uh, and inspiration. Um, I wouldn't have to prepare anything. I could just, uh, you know, <laughs> uh, 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 I could just assume that, that the spirit will move me to say something, inter uh, you know, something creative at the, uh, uh, as time went on. Um, uh, on the other hand, uh, uh, I couldn't help preparing something because uh, a couple of weeks ago when I was working on an on, uh, on, uh, unrelated thing, I happened to be looking at Scientific American from 1958 and, and there was an ad in that article I was looking at saying this year in September we're having a whole issue on creativity in science and so naturally I turned to the Scientific American of, of September 1958 to see what, uh, what they said that that month and uh, there was a, a, a really nice article in there by Paul Halmus, uh, uh, one of the, uh, the, the best ex, uh, ma you know, mathematicians who also writes well about mathematics and, um, and, and one of the, and, and so he, he addressed the question of, uh, of how do mathematicians get, uh, you know, get their ideas and, um, uh, and what, well to make it Short, uh, here's, here's what he said. A mathematician is not a deduction machine, but a human being. New mathematics comes not by pure thought and deduction, but by sweat, experiment, induction, and if lucky, inspiration. Um, now, um, that, so, that was, you know, uh, that, that sort of describes the way it seems to me. Now, now mathematics, computer science are, are the two um, unnatural sciences, or you know, artificial uh, the science, the, the things that are not uh, that are that are based on artificial, uh, created by people instead of in nature, um, and that makes them somewhat different from the uh, uh, you know, from the other sciences because in mathematics we we can actually uh, we can actually prove things and you know solve a problem and know that we've got the answer. While in the natural sciences you just get more and more evidence for things. Um, uh, now another another uh, uh, thing I want to tell you about is an, is an experience that I had um, that relates to this idea of of, of, of creativity. Uh, uh, it, it was a little more than 25 years ago. Um, I woke up in the middle of the night uh, with the sort of knowing that I should write a little book uh, called Serial Numbers. And I'm not going to tell you much about this this booklet, but it turned out it's a little novelette. But I but but I just figured it would be the, it would be the coolest way to describe a, a, a theory that I had that John Connolly had told me about um, a few months before. And, and uh, so I uh, we were on sabbatical that year, living in Norway, and and. Um, I told my wife in the morning, you know, I decided before I finish the art of computer programming, I've, I've got to write this other little book, but, but I can do it in a week. Um, <laughs> and, uh, and, and so she said, hey, this is, this is good, a nice time uh, for you to do it. And so we, we arranged it that I, I, could, uh, I, I could rent a, uh, a hotel room in downtown uh, Oslo for, for a week in, in January and, um, 
and, and actually, I, um, this hotel was very near where Ibsen used to live, so I figured maybe some of his vibes would would, would get through to me. <laughs> and um, and when I went there, it was it was a fantastic experience. I I, I um, uh, every morning uh, I. I I would start out eating a big uh, Norwegian breakfast. This is this is uh, anybody ever been there will know this. It, it was enough uh, to keep me going. I didn't need lunch, and then I would work on my on this book. Um, uh, and I and then about uh, two o'clock in the afternoon, I would I would get to a, a, a I would get to a stumbling block, something I couldn't you know I I, I I couldn't advance it anymore. I had to think about it, so I'd go out and walk around the streets of Oslo for an hour or so. And, uh, the, and all of a sudden, the solution would present itself to me. I come back to my hotel room and I start writing, and I have a leisurely supper in the evening, and then uh, go back up to my room, write some more. Uh, but the amazing thing was then um, that the books was seeming to write itself. In fact, after I would turn off the light, after uh, uh, you know, at, at at the end of the day, um, the, the next paragraphs would, would would come to my mind, and I couldn't go to sleep unless I would. Turn, turn the light back on again and jot, jot it down. The ideas were coming so fast, I only had time to write down the first le letter of every word. Um, you know, so I, so I would, I would you know, basically put them all down and then sleep uh, very soundly. And, and the next morning after breakfast, uh, figure out what I had, you know, what I had written, and, <laughs> and I was ready to go until two o'clock again. And this went on for six days, and it seemed to be like—I mean, I can understand now why why people had this idea of the, of the muse, uh, you know, of a muse sitting over your shoulder, uh, and, and 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 it seemed to be, uh, in a way, the, not exactly dictated to me, but I. But anyway, uh, the funny thing was at the at the end of the of of, of six days, I finished the book, and then I rested, <laughs> and uh, and. And on the seventh day, I, I, try, I, I tried to write a letter to my secretary telling her how to type it up. And I, I would get in the middle of a sentence and I couldn't finish the sentence. I, I wouldn't, in other words, all of a sudden the muse had, had totally gone. Um, I, 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 I would get to the middle of a sentence, I wouldn't know what, what I was going to say in this sentence, you know, and I would scratch it out and start again. Um, so, so this was, now, now many other times in, in my life I've had this, I, this, this feeling that, uh, you know, that, that I'm being inspired somehow. Uh, in, in a magical, I have no idea how, but this was the most uh, most intense thing I had. Um, now, the other thing I wanted to talk about is uh, uh, this book by Dorothy Sayers, The Mind of the Maker. Uh, I, had, I, I brought it with me uh, to Boston because I hadn't had time to read it before, and, I, and uh, it's, it, it's a, it, it, it turns out, I, you know, it had been recommended to me, and it turns out, uh, uh, it, it, I think it's a wonderful uh, discussion of of creativity and spirituality and so on, and, and uh, she uh, uh, wrote it uh, oh, in, the, in the early 40s, I think, and um, uh, and uh, it's really I, I found lots of interesting things in there. For example, one of the first uh, um, points that she made that impressed me was that that ideas don't satisfy these principles of uh, conservation of mass or energy or momentum like like I was talking about uh, you know you, you can get a new idea without having to destroy another idea uh, in, in the first place and and um, and and in in here she 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 uh, found a very strong uh, connection between what goes on in her mind as a as as a writer. I mean, I I think uh, she's probably the best writer of mystery stories that have ever been done. Her mystery stories not only are mystery stories, but they're they have many many levels and there's and wonderful character development and uh, and other uh, aspects uh, uh, um, all the way through. It's it's so rich. It's wonderful. Um, but uh, she she talks about her experiences as a writer and how that and, and that kind of creativity how she how that gave her insight into the the Christian doctrine of Trinity, uh, how the uh, how um, uh, th there's there's there are three aspects of 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 this uh, uh, of her work that she sees as writing. There's the creative idea, there's the embodiment of that idea, and then there's the understanding and and the communication of that idea. And uh, she saw that that actually was uh, was three things in one. Which uh, now. Um, let me uh, uh, just say a few a few more things about what she had in here. She said, um, 
for example, um, uh, she talks about the compulsion. Uh, says, so whenever the the creature being created strive for existence is dominant, everything else will have to give way to it. The creator will push all other things aside and get down to the task in a spirit of mingled delight and exasperation. Um, uh, I, I, uh, I, I liked especially the, the, the last chapter, which, which is about problem solving, and, uh, and she, she um, points out that, that, that in, in, in mathematics we, we, uh, uh, we can state problems and then we solve them. And I, I remember once Frances Seattle telling me how she, she can't, you know, she's really interested in solving uh, computer science problems in, in, in her research and then uh, she finally solves it. Uh, and, uh, and two days later, uh, she's got to come up with, she's come up with another problem. So, so you never get to the end of it. And in, in fact, this is the, this is the, uh, this is the idea. It, once, if, if you solve the problem, it's, it's, it's dead and there's no more life and nothing more to do. So you have to have another problem, problem. And, 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 and uh, in, in real life, um, in fact, uh, it, it's misleading that, that mathematic problems get solved because most of the things that occur in real life, um, are are sort of insolvable. There's there's tension between you know yin and yang. There between things that are that that, that can only be um, mixed together, but never actually uh, 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 solved. So she, the artist uh, doesn't see life as a problem to be solved, but rather as a medium for creation. And um, and and she doesn't just throw up her hands and say, well, if these problems in real life are unsolvable. Uh, 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 let's not, we can't do anything with them. I remember reading uh, Václav Havel uh, uh, comment uh, three, four years ago saying how uh, uh, similar thoughts that it's, uh, that, that people are misled when they, when they, when, when they think you can, that, that you, the, the problems that arise in, in life are like puzzles that you, that, that you just have to find the trick to, to, to solve them. Uh, but, but he didn't, Carried further to say what you do with it, uh, but but Dorothy Sayers ha had this nice idea. He said, uh, um, "Well, first she says the concept of problem and solution is is as meaningless applied to the act of creation as when it's applied to the act of procreation." Um, you see, she says to add John to Mary in in a procreative process does not produce a solution of John and Mary's combined problem. It produces <laughs> it produces George or Susan who in addition to being a complicating factor in the life of his or her parents, possesses an independent personality with an entirely new set of problems. And as I, and as, as I said, uh, you know, in mathematics and, and, and with respect to Francis, uh, uh, once you've creatively solved a problem, you must go on. But the, the, the point that, that, that uh, Dorothy makes is that this is really um, an opportunity to be creative. Uh, we take an apparently un tractable problem and use it to make a new thing and uh, and this is where uh, and uh, this is why uh, why creativity is a wonderful thing now I I'm a little worried that creativity is is dangerous the the world couldn't stand more than more than 10 people who were creative just as exactly the same way I am I mean if, if there were more than if there were more than 10 canoes in the world we wouldn't have time to read each other's books for, uh, <laughs> uh, it, it, it would be terrible, and um, so fortunately, there's lots and lots of different different kinds of creativity, um, and uh, as we as we uh, develop, uh, it, it's it's nice uh, it, it's nice to, that uh, uh, our software now is becoming more interactive, so that the users are are uh, are, are are being more creative as to, as they use these things. Um, I. Uh, uh, now I just have to think creatively about some punchline that I should end with, um, <laughs> um, and I had one in mind. What, what, anyway, uh, uh, so so I I, I believe uh, uh, that it's not going to be dangerous for everybody to be creative. In fact, and that uh, and and I'm glad to see that that uh, uh, tr trends are now that we're that we're um, uh, assuming that that everyone and not just people who. Uh, not just a, not just a few people in every city um, are, uh, are are acting creative. In fact, I, I guess I, I see the uh, the security guards and all the people that I meet at the at the, at the tech uh, 
center every day are, are being creative in their in, in their conduct of life. All right. Thank you. Well, this is a pretty difficult topic, and I have very few firm answers, although I will take lots of firm positions which may fool some of you into thinking that I actually know something. For that, I apologize in advance. Um, to provide some, some context here, I, I thought I would annotate um, the autobiography. Um, I'm not a computer scientist. Um, uh, I'm more of a software designer. And there are some significant differences there between uh, science, uh, engineering, and, and design that really influence, I think, one's outlook on, on the issues at hand. Uh, time doesn't permit going into that uh, there right now. But what I would say is, in the context of being asked to, uh, being expected to be knowledgeable about computer science, it's sort of like asking a profound dyslexic uh, to uh, uh, act as a scholar of literature. Uh, it can be done, but it's, uh, it's quite an art form. A bit about myself, um, I am uh, Jewish by birth and cultural tradition. Uh, the particular branch of Judaism I come from doesn't have spirituality. We have guilt. <laughs> but for whatever reason, for about 30 years now, I've had a, a strong interest in spirituality, whatever that is, and I'll try to get into that, and in particular, forms of uh, spiritual paths that come out of, uh, out of the East, out of, uh, out of India and, uh, and China and so on. Um, I w had become a teacher of transcendental meditation in the 1970s. It was a very interesting experience. Um, I can tell you that people really don't levitate. And in fact, it is a cult, uh, at least if you get highly involved with it. So I have a a lot of bruises uh, acquired along the way from, from some of my uh, involvements. Um, I'm kind of a Buddhist fellow traveler in the sense that uh, I have a lot of affinity for a Buddhist way of thinking, but I just can't seem to make it in any organized religion, including Buddhism. So that's why I would say I'm a fellow traveler rather than a practitioner. Oh, and on the God issue, I think it's a very interesting and particularly Western conceit to so closely link God and spirituality as if without God there is no spirituality. There are some billions of people on the planet that just operate from a different point of, of view that are very comfortable saying that they operate in a spiritual context and the issue of God is one that is uh, not, not front and center. I'm a kind of devout agnostic on the, the God issue. Uh, kind of, we'll, we'll see what happens, but it's not, some, it's not a native thing inside my framework, whereas uh, spirituality is. So, uh, but I, I, and, and one more thing by way of, of context, just so you understand that I am perhaps um, a bit peculiar. I am really genuinely, sincerely not a materialist in the following sense. There are a lot of people who, who really genuinely believe that what there is comes down to molecules and atoms and subatomic particles and that's it, period, in terms of the fundamental constituents of what there is. And I'm kind of on the other side of that in saying that that stuff ultimately in some sense feels to me to be an arising, a manifestation of something that is a lot deeper and a lot more mysterious and something that in some way I cannot articulate fundamentally also has to do with awareness or, or, or consciousness. Given that, where does all this intersect with computer science? There's a remark that I've heard ascribed to Marvin Minsky, but I have no idea if Marvin actually said this or not, and in this context it doesn't matter. But allegedly, he said, in effect, that he vastly prefers a virtual sunset to a real one. 
I hear enough giggles to suggest that you've heard similar things. And I've always been really puzzled by that, as I am a big aficionado of, of the virtual and that which we can create with and through computers, whether it's in simulations or robotics or productivity tools or, you know, name your favorite thing to do with computers. But in the Department of Sunsets, <laughs> I've always found virtual sunsets to be wanting in that they always sort of bottom out. If you meditate on a virtual sunset, sooner or later, like, it dissolves into pixels or something like that. Whereas a real sunset to me, of course I'm speaking both, I'm speaking mainly metaphorically but not entirely, is infinitely mysterious. There is always something new to discover or some new experience of sunset which is possible. It's a kind of a guarantee about reality that despite our considerable progress in, in the creation of the, the virtual and artificial, we really haven't even come close to, to touching. And so, pers to, personally, this is not a view I would seek to convert a single one of you to, it strikes me that some of the hard AI goals of that program, broadly speaking, which involve the creation of, of creatures or entities that uh, are really like us, is idolatrous in a way. Even more important, I think, though, it's ill-fated, because I think to believe that is to miss something about the sort of fundamental depth that people have and can have by themselves, in their own awareness, with each other in relationships, and collectively. It's this enormous depth, and again, I'm speaking mostly metaphorically here, um, that I think distinguishes the human condition. It is what makes us capable of the worst evils and the highest goods. And I think the domain of the spiritual is the one, or one of the ones in the society, where we get to ask fundamental questions. Who are we? Where did we come from? And how is it that fundamentally things are the way that they are? For me, those questions have always been very resonant and I found that various spiritual traditions and teachings have a lot to offer as investigative um, tools uh, along the way. And so coming back to uh, you know, computer science and that which can be made from it and, and with it, to the extent that you know, it too is seen and used as a tool to help us understand ourselves and reality better, to give us some insight, to extend ourselves to, uh, in, in the words of Doug Engelbart, one of my great heroes, augment our, our intellects. Uh, I think it is a wonderful and terrific thing and serves spiritual purpose. And some of the artifacts and theories that we create, if they're a celebration of that deepest humanity, can also be viewed as spiritual work. So ultimately, I do think that there is quite a lot of harmony, at least potentially, between spirituality and computer science. Thank you. Well, this was, uh, this was great. There were lots of uh, interesting um, lines thrown out here. Um, anthropomorphizing spirituality, the opportunity that some graduate student has here to create the first guilt-driven uh, computer system. Uh, I'd like to um, uh, turn to the panelists, first of all, to comment on uh, anything that any of the other panelists have to, had to say. No fair commenting on your own comments. <laughs> Don? Yeah, just quickly, uh, uh, what Mitch, Mitch said reminded me of a, of, a, of a BC cartoon I saw about 10 years ago where there's two guys, uh, you know, Johnny Hart's uh, strip, and there's two guys looking at a sunset. And one of them says, oh, isn't this a wonderful sunset? And the other one says, well, I'd like a little more purple over here. <laughs> I, I, wouldn't we all? Yeah. <laughs> No, I mean, it's just, uh, you know, these, it, it, it just struck me how, how uh, uh, when you know that something is uh, 
is 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 uh, has been planned, uh, it, uh, it you have a higher standard of beauty for it. Uh, but somehow sunset, we don't expect it to be absolutely absolutely perfect. And so people always say, well, you know. Why didn't God do it this way a little bit, little bit better? You know, why, why did He make the universe so, uh, uh, so sparse? Because He could pack it with a lot more stuff and get a lot more, a lot more, a lot more done. And so, on. Wow. anyway. Yeah. Yeah. I just like to make a comment to Mitch again on these AI being ill fated. So uh, <laughs> <laughs> it's too direct, Mitch. <laughs> So let's see, uh, I really, you know, like I said, I do have also a problem of uh, accepting that we are going to really have robots that are like humans. But if we think well, we are happy with living with tons of other humans that are uh, deficient in some ways. My liver doesn't work probably as well as yours, my lungs. I don't breathe as well, I mean, I don't know. We all have defects. So what's the problem of thinking about robots that have the defect of not being spiritual? Uh, probably missing a soul. I mean, if we have a soul, okay, robots won't, big deal. You know, we have, I don't think that that's that much of a problem because, you know, we are not perfect, so what's the big deal of having a eye, having a goal, of having humans that are not perfect just by this little aspect, they don't have soul. Well, I don't know, but I mean, why do we think that that's a problem? I, I don't think it's a problem at all. Oh, great. So I mean, we I, all agree. You, you may, have, may have misconstrued my remarks. So I, I think this stuff is really cool because it, it sort of sh shows these systems are very interesting because they show a lot of emergent behavior that you wouldn't predict from seeing any one of the parts. They're very bottom up instead of top down. And mind you, you know it's a panel. You need to say something provocative. To, to say. It was, it, it was in the panel hand, but but no. The only thing I, I have an ob objection to is this kind of golden calf uh, vision of AI that I suspect find something weak and flawed about the human condition and it's this Pygmalion attempt to create something more perfect. And I find that as a theme that undergirds some AI research, but I'd certainly never make the case that it, you know, any given researcher is driven by that. It's just kind of a pet peeve that since I'm on a panel here, I thought I'd sound off on. I, I'm going to give, I'll turn to the audience in a minute. I'm going to give the panel. I think it would be a great achievement just to produce a robot that's as screwed up as I am, and that's, <laughs> that's worth shooting for. Uh, and one thing that, that one central puzzle of this is, is how do we know when a robot has a soul or not? So I'll ask rhetorically, Mitch, how do you know whether I have soul or an intellect or not? Yep. For and, me, soul is like this God thing, you see. If you don't believe in God, I mean, I'd be happy to find out that he or she exists, but if it's not a belief, you're relieved of a lot of problems, like why does God do X? Oh. <laughs> Similarly, I, I don't know about soul. That's a you got to understand. Genuinely, the serious point is that's kind of a concept that comes out of Western paths of spirituality, largely. And if you go to Buddhism, for instance, it's you know endless tomes about all sorts of things, but the concept of soul doesn't arise. I hope that somebody will explain to me you know, why we need that concept or what, what work it does. And then, then it could be interesting to talk about, you know, whether robots could have them or not. Well, we, we can back out of this a little bit emotionally and say that instead of discussing soul, we're going to discuss purpose or perhaps even just semantic meaning. Where does semantic meaning come from? How is it that a word or a person comes to, comes to convey meaning? And there's this problem that if you tr start to get too rigorous and strict and, and make your definitions uh, too narrow, you find yourself backing into solipsism, which has problems of its own. But if you don't back into yourself into that corner, then you're bound to be a little bit too liberal and to make mistakes. Uh, as, for example, the four-year-olds in thinking these little robots are alive or perhaps feel pain. Well, maybe they do. I'm not sure. Uh, the other thing I'd like to... They don't. Okay. <laughs> I will take your word for it. <laughs> I'd also like to make a couple of responses to some things that Don said. First of all, I wouldn't mind having two or three canoes in the world. Maybe you should stand it. On the other hand, I concluded long ago that I couldn't keep up with even one Asimov. So, uh, 
So I think you're putting out about the right amount of stuff, and we're grateful for it. But I would like to push back on the idea that you can, on the notion that you can create a new idea without it destroying an old one. I'm, we like to program in Lisp for small talk or job and pretend that we can cons new objects without destroying old ones, but eventually you run out of memory and have to pay the piper. And uh, if your mind is finite, as I think mine is, I think that's a more useful model of it, then I think I agree with Sherlock Holmes that after a certain point for every new idea you take in, you've got to get rid of something else in your mental attic. And finally, I would like to allude to uh, a theory that I actually heard from Jerry Sussman that uh, it's very important that you sleep because that's when your brain is garbage collecting. <laughs> And a dream is when you get interrupted in the middle and there's junk left in the registers. No? I, I just want to say that um, still I, I can write a new book without, without having to remember what's in the other one, the old one. Um, <laughs> No, no she, uh, I mean, she says the poet is not obliged to destroy Hamlet in order to create Falstaff. All right, let's, uh, if, you, you're, if you don't want to talk to each other anymore, let's... Uh... <laughs> <laughs> happy to do that, but we could make it a bigger conversation. All right, let's, have it a bit, let's, have, let's make a bigger conversation. Yes, sir. Uh, I have to admit to being relatively ignorant of process the theology, and I don't have a particular opinion on it one way or the other. Um, I think it is possible that God is at least all of those things, but my general finding is whenever I try to say God is something in the attempt to cut something off, I usually end up being wrong somehow. Just because I think a set of finite descriptions maybe doesn't capture everything there is to know. At least, well, I'll stop there. Sure, go ahead. <laughs> Could you repeat the last sentence, I, your last qu sentence question again, because I'm not quite sure I caught the details of it. Okay, thank you. Uh, first of all, I note that you use the word should, and I will um, notice that that's got a free variable that needs to be bound to some purpose. <laughs> so who, to whose purpose should I bind that flapping free variable? My purpose? God's? <laughs> I'm pointing out that should is a loaded word, and but I have to admit that no matter... I'll, Okay, well, I'll let you flip there then. I, I think that, however, that no matter how we bind that, um, 
that there's this problem of knowing what God's purpose is and trying to align ourselves with that. And there's a question of whether you think that, that can be somehow derived or deduced in a rational method, perhaps using the scientific method or some other, or that has to come by means of faith or divine revelation or the, the throwing of dice or you know, whatever your preferred method is. Uh, I happen to like the, the inspired revelation myself, and then even that can all, you can try to cross-check in various ways. But I admit that ultimately uh, there's no way I can prove to you that we should do this or that. We, we kind of muddle along on faith, I think. Yes. Yeah, I just want to go after Mitch. <laughs> Remember, I'm, 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 I'm here to, inf to enforce tolerance now, so go after as little aggressive. I'm your husband and no kid tolerance. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> well, for you, that's fine. <laughs> I don't have to have religion, but uh, I'm going to quote, God made man in his own image. That's a recursive definition. <laughs> <laughs> Mitch, you get equal time. You know, and therefore... I can create things that yeah. themselves can be created. I don't have any problem with that. <laughs> but I, I want you to... No, I don't see it well in making something... No, no, I... In the, in the, in the right. strong AI view. Uh, under that interpretation of strong AI, I absolutely agree with you. I wanted to just ask Guy or comment on this soul and, and, and or purpose thing. I mean, it seems to me one of the, and maybe you can shed some light on how you construct this, since I gather that you see them in some sort of relationship or continuum, which intuitively sounds very appealing, but for me, a purpose, what kind of entity is it? Where does it fit into the concept ontology? A purpose is like it's a kind of a behavior descriptive kind of entity that, you know, that's what you could talk about what a purpose is in terms of various behaviors and their relationship over time and, and so on. Whereas, and I just may have the, a very crude view of this, when you talk about soul, typically I experience that in terms of it's, it's a kind of physical or paraphysical entity, a very different kind of uh, entity than something which is merely a description of purpose. And so I kind of feel a disconnect between those two. And this is not word mincing, this is in search of illumination. If you make a connection, I'd love to get let in on it. Well, in struggling for metaphor, I'm, I'm, I'm led to ask the question of whether we, we think of soul as being more like a, a, a paraphysical entity, as you say, or whether it's perhaps more like a pattern and uh, a pattern that, with, you know, that may have a, an underlying physical substrate. And I guess the best comparison I can ask is whether you think a computer virus is real, you know, independent of the uh, bits of magnetic oxide that it's embedded in at this or that instant. Sure. Yeah, absolutely. absolutely. Well, Great, then we're done. done. <laughs> <laughs> so, Okay, if, if you strip away all of the, the paraphysical stuff and you kind of talk about pattern and you describe patterns in terms of de descriptions of behaviors, that's fine. With a virus, you can ultimately point back to uh, the underlying substrate in a way that's pretty coherent. Now, can you do that with soul? It's the pointing back to the substrate with soul where things just seem to get really murky. Yeah, I'm not sure, and I'm not, I'm not even sure whether I mean this, to suggest that a soul is a pattern quite literally and to say that it's just a pattern in physical substance, or whether I merely mean that as a metaphor. But I, I think thinking about uh, computational objects, such as viruses, that seem to have some kind of minimal life of their own, and some purpose of their own, at least we talk about viruses as if they're good and evil, and uh, you know, there are some good viruses that go around you know, sort of spreading vaccine against nasty viruses. But then, that, but then I think that may have less to do with their inherent nature than with our projecting values onto their existence. So that's, that's a set of... Your evidence for this is what? Evidence. For the strong claims you just made about what's going to happen in 20 or 30 years? Evidence. Evidence. You just cite something so I have a, a marker as to what your, your, your beliefs are based on. Well, When you have virtual reality closer, 
it basically stimulates the nervous system, aspects of the nervous system through artificial stimulation. It seems to be shifted to examine that from the point of view of the nervous system. Well, I have to say, this, this is, I'm, I'm glad someone spoke up for that point of view, because it was that precisely that point of view that I was intending to attack severely and undermine. <laughs> <laughs> so I'm glad. Um, no, I mean, if you just do a little bit of cultural history and you look back at the history of such claims, that in 10 or 20 or 30 years, we will be able, be able to do X. They're all variants of the uh, harshly strong AI claim. None of them have come true. In fact, what we see is that the goal is rather more distant than we ever thought it was, especially as we learn more about people. So there's a set of that, looking at that body of evidence, and you just go back to see what people were saying in 56 and 66 and 76 and see where we are now, you know, is, is a contrary body of evidence. And, well, it's, it's, it's worthy of a debate. But let's yeah, there are lots of people who want to comment on this, but I'm actually going to take a poll. Okay? You heard the claim from the front row. How many people believe it? You want to repeat your claim? That there will be a very good virtual reality. Indistinguishable virtual reality. Within a given period, at some point, it could be 200 years, I happen to think my knowledge of the nervous system is going to be closer to 30 or 40, but it doesn't make a difference. 200 years that we are going to be able to replace what we sense now as reality. You all, you all believe you are here, and there's somebody sitting I, next to you with a purple shirt. I, or I just rented the Matrix. <laughs> <laughs> Okay. What? Beg your pardon? <laughs> well, I don't know. It seems to get, get an argument going between them. All right. The claim is the claim is too vaguely stated to take the poll on. Everybody's going to interpret what he said differently. Okay. Let's uh, let, 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 let's uh, Charles. You're next. Uh, any comments uh, back on this? Somebody else. Somebody else other than Mitch. Okay. I actually, I mean, I really, being an AI researcher and aiming to get to that day, I really don't think that day is reachable, believe me. And probably you have the nanotechnology, and I struggle, struggle to put the intelligence there on the technology. I struggle to have robots that do more than pushing balls. And Deep Blue struggled to do more than thinking of what's the next move for chess. Probably, I think that uh, there is this thing about hardware, and there is this thing about this completeness that we have, probably, which, which still, how do you know, how, still um, completely puzzles me. Because although I believe eventually that we will be able to have a thumb that you don't know whether it's your thumb or someone else's thumb, we will, <laughs> are we ever going to have the ability to really encode, program, uh, given that the way that we do computer science or the way that we will have to put onto the technology, the decision making requires us to understand ourselves. I mean, and this is like my big question. I mean, it's like, give me all the technology. If you were claiming that 100 years from now, 
Manuela, you could really know how you learn and you could reproduce in paper exactly how did you go from, you know, not knowing anything at the beginning of your life till you are, you know, 40 years old or something. That would scare me. But if you actually make the claim that technology will give me an artifact that will look physically as me, doesn't scare me at all, in the sense, it doesn't solve my problem yet, okay? It's more of a, so, it's more of a substrate question than a, than a knowledge question. Guy was saying there's pattern and soul and what do you reduce it to in the substrate. I'm pointing out that the substrate can be artificially created in a million different ways that are not the real world. And the interesting question is, if you grow up in such a substrate that is not the real world, do you have a soul? And I see. Those are the interesting questions. Right. Okay, okay. Guy, you want to take that? Okay. Uh, yeah, actually, actually, I'm going to address the broader question as well. It seems to me that if what you want to accomplish is not being able to tell whether this is your thumb or someone else's thumb, you don't need fancy computers or nanotechnology. You can do that with a couple of bottles of alcohol. <laughs> <laughs> and we have some experience with that. Well, humanity at large has some experience. I don't drink much myself. But, but uh, there may be another obstacle to doing what the gentleman over here in the, uh, is that a pink or an orange sweater? I can't quite see it from here. Salmon sweater, yes, has, has uh, suggested. <laughs> Thank you. Good, now we have a name for you. <laughs> um, there may be another possible technological obstruction. I'll dredge up an old, slightly weird conjecture that uh, I, I published in a paper back in 1981 in reply to something that uh, Duff, Doug Hofstetter wrote. We were at a conference together. And uh, it, there is a possibility that the physical structure of the universe may be such that the only feasible embedding of intelligence in a small enough space that you're not subject to speed of light considerations and can interact with human beings at their real time may be the bio biochemical one. In fact, it, we may run into problems trying to build electrical, silicon, whatever computers out of other stuff than what our heads have been made out of and be able to get it in a small enough space that the pieces can interact quickly enough that they can have conversations with us. And so that is a possible technological limitation that, that we shouldn't overlook in the debate. Interesting. Yes, sir. In, in religion, people tend to uh, bury each other in incomprehensible complexity. And the same sort of thing happens in computer science. <laughs> No. Uh, yes, sir. Up there. Actually, like to, if I can jump real sure, quick, quick one. I'm going to conjecture that 200 years from now we'll have decided that computers aren't interesting and are really boring and we'll have gone on to something else. You know, it'll yeah. just be a technology in the background like refrigeration technology is now. Well, unless we build robots. I will let them know. <laughs> yes. Maybe we could take some kind of a poll as to how many years people think it'll be before we'll have the, um, uh, you, know, you know, the panelists and the moderator and the audience all, all composed of robots. <laughs> well, it's a serious question, right? I mean, yes, you, you went, I mean, that, that's a version of, of of the the uh, the poll I was trying to take, I, I assume it was something like that that you were. Um, yes. I'll just ask rather than um, you know trying to get a get a get a time limit, but just to get some sense of the audience, do um, you think that at some finite time in the future this uh, this panel um, could be entirely 
virtual. That is to say, not, what? <laughs> well, it, 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 I don't know. I just, uh, <laughs> the, 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 okay, so, so it's, do you understand the question? It's pretty much. I mean, you know, you guys, you imagine that you really are who you are, but none of us, but we're all, we're all completely artificial. How many, how many believe, what? I, I can't refine the question anymore. But I, I want to ask some question of this. <laughs> <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> All right. How, how, how many? Th how many think we'll get there? <laughs> Thanks a lot. <laughs> how many? How many think so? Maybe a, maybe a third. Yeah, maybe a third. How many think not? Yeah, it's about it's about one third. It's two thirds. Okay. Good. Uh, yes, you were next. Yep. Oh, um, I'm glad you brought that up. I, I checked today and about 280 hits have been made on that page. Uh, 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 there's, uh, I would like people to prepare for the, for the last two lectures I'm giving by reading a, 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 a neat short story by Raymond Smolian and I, and I put it on, uh, on the web and I guess one way to find it is by looking at Anna First's uh, page and following links. Um, or, or you get to my home page and then you add smallion.html to the thing. But uh, it, it, you'll, I think you'll enjoy it. And it's, and it's, a, it's a really interesting little story on, on several levels. Okay, well, I, I did read it. I, I have a question about stuff. I did read it, and my question is this. Um, the story is called Planet Without Land. God injects some evil into the world, and at the, in the end, all the repercussions play themselves out, and everybody becomes happy and a believer again in the end. The question is for the believers in God on the panel. Why is that idea helpful or useful in Christianity or whatever your beliefs are? Because why wouldn't God just leave things alone when they were fine to begin with? That's my question. I don't know what homework assignment this refers to. So yeah, I'm, I'm sorry. So, uh, uh, and, and, and of course, I'm going to be talking about this in, in the other lectures, and, I, um, and I, I'd like to let the other panelists uh, have their day today. So, so, I've been so why, why don't you answer the question in the next, when, so, that's so, the next lecture when you've got the Right, so, so, yeah, so anyway, I, I think uh, uh, this, th this is a parable that helps you understand something about about religion, about faith, and so on, and and uh, I actually didn't care for the ending of the story as much as I did for the for the middle of it, but uh, but but it, it it gets into some of the things that Mitch was saying because uh, uh, it, it shows the limits of, of rationality as to how much uh, when you get to something like uh, like, like humor, um, how how do we know uh, uh, when it, you know to make a machine that would laugh at the right time. And, and would it really have, have a sense of humor? Okay, we only got a few minutes and there are a lot of people who'd like to ask questions, so yes sir, over here. I have a, uh, a two- Amen. <laughs> that, you just said it very well. I, I hope people on the web can I got, get to hear that. I, I hope you weren't hoping for an answer to the question I, here. You want, you want, you want I, to I, I think that, you know, how can we answer that question, right? <laughs> on the yeah. other hand, on the other hand, let me tell you something. I do believe that motivation, that motivation that you kind of claim that drives your child to have, to get conscious and the computer not. If you would have little robots around and if you would interact with them, the outcome of those interactions could surprise you. I just think that we have to move one step ahead and think that robots can live around you and you can kick them and you can pet them and you can just say hi on the way. Maybe they never answer, but you don't know. Depends on how you program them. So the motivation might be on our, our attitude towards these little things that we create. Mitch, do you want to? Oh, yeah, I mean, first, two things. Just echo, that's a really deep mystery. And I think the kindergarten of that mystery, which is probably resolved sort of po as a postdoctoral fellow or beyond, uh, for me goes through psychology, which is to say one of the differences 
between the two-year-old and the computer, as far as I'm concerned, is that the two-year-old has some kind of self-sense, some representation of the self to itself, and that my Windows 98 machine kind of doesn't. <laughs> well, that's a, yes, okay. Um, Barbara. <laughs> yeah, I, I, I really think that's a very good question. Let me just, uh, I think that this, would be my, this will be my last comment, but let me just tell you something. I really believe that um, we uh, can uh, increase our spirituality and our knowledge of ourselves and our knowledge of our origins by creating, trying to create little intelligent creatures trying to create intelligent artifacts and interact with them. I mean, if you think well about in the history of science, at the beginning we thought that the Earth was the center of the universe and we were very disturbed by knowing that we were not. After all, you know, the sun was there. God, I mean, how could we be going around the sun? Then we went and we always think that we are the center of everything. But it has been through science that really probably Science has forced us to, to know more about ourselves, to know more about the world. I do believe that the goal of AI has, is to know more about ourselves, about the world, about how to interact with, and creating with artifacts, physical artifacts, will, if God exists, which I do believe, will never contradict the existence of God, period. It will just actually make it even more visible. Now, how, and how, I don't know, you know, but I do, I'm not afraid of pursuing an AI goal because I do believe that knowing more about myself and knowing more about the world can never l let me to the conclusion that God doesn't exist or that eventually an another, I don't think that I will get to that end. On the opposite, okay? Okay, last question and we'll have to make it a quick one, thank you. <laughs> thank you. And, and uh, unless anyone wants to pick up, I'm going to thank uh, all of the participants very much for their contributions. Thank you all for being here.